please. The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I want to remind members of a few matters, including some required by the regulations accompanying House Resolution 965, which established the framework for remote committee proceedings. I don't know if uh, we've gone through this already, but I would uh, ask all members on the WebEx platform to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. This will minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. Members on the WebEx platform are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. Uh, the staff has been instructed not to mute members except uh, where a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members on the WebEx platform are reminded that they may only attend one remote hearing at a time. So if you are participating today, please remain with us during the hearing. Members should try to avoid coming in and out of the meeting, uh, particularly during the question period. If during the hearing members wish to be recognized, the chair recommends that members identify themselves by name so as to facilitate the chair's recognition. I would also ask that members be patient as the chair proceeds, given the nature of the online platform the committee is using. In addition, for members participating in person, the attending physician provided a guidance. Has that guidance been given? Has the mask information been given? I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Today, the committee convenes to conduct oversight over the Treasury Department's and Federal Reserve's pandemic response. This pandemic continues to have a terrible impact across the nation. There have been over 13.4 million coronavirus cases in the U.S which is almost double the amount of cases when the secretary and chair last testified in September. And over 267,000 people have lost their lives to the virus. Hospitalizations and deaths are surging as this crisis spirals out of control. Small businesses are shutting their doors permanently and millions are at risk of eviction, foreclosure and being laid off. A historic number of Americans resoundingly voted for a new direction last month by overwhelmingly voting for President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. The American people have made it clear that they want a government that will fight this virus and will protect their families and small businesses from the impacts of COVID-19. So Secretary Mnuchin, on a call last month, many committee uh, Democrats and I committed to not going home until we have a deal or a stimulus package that is desperately needed across the country. But as negotiations continue, I'm appalled uh, that you would knowingly make matters worse by permanently ending essential emergency lending programs, leaving states, cities, and small businesses out to dry as the nation faces a dire and worsening phase of the pandemic crisis. Uh, and there is simply no justification or justifiable reason uh, to take these tools away with the pandemic crisis worse than it has been and the Biden administration arriving in January. And Chairman uh, Paul, I'm also concerned uh, that the Federal Reserve acceded to Treasury's request after publicly indicating the importance of extending these facilities. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, I'm also very concerned that the Treasury Department may be taking actions that will undermine our housing markets during the pandemic by reportedly working with the Federal Housing Finance Agency to rush to government-sponsored enterprises out of conservatorships before the end of the Trump administration. And so, these actions follow 
of the Trump administration's obstruction of the transition process, delaying important information sharing about the pandemic response and national security between the Biden transition team and the current administration. So today you will be held to account for your misguided actions. Before recognizing the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina who's with us today, uh, I'm going to make sure uh, that our witnesses are received uh, responsibly in a way that they should be received and thank them for being here. And so uh, prior to that, um, I would normally recognize them, I suppose, at this point. However, I think that uh, as the agenda has been laid out today, um, I'm going to go ahead and recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And look, um, I know there's been a lot of partisan talk by my uh, uh, colleagues on the Democrat side of the aisle uh, attacking the actions of the Treasury Secretary and even the Federal Reserve. Um, and I know committee Democrats uh, and a lot of Democrats in Congress said that uh, they wouldn't go home until they had a deal. And then uh, they went home for 10 days. So uh, I, there's not a whole lot of uh, believability coming uh, from uh, our, our fellow politicians here on Capitol Hill right now. It's quite frustrating. Uh, but Chairman Powell, um, Secretary Mnuchin, I want to thank you for being with us today and being uh, so available. Um, I also want to commend you for the quick and decisive work that you both have taken. Um, and, and, and I think that that is uh, something that we should commend you for. Um, but today, I, I think there's also a reason for optimism. Uh, the coronavirus vaccines are moving at an unprecedented pace. Last month, Pfizer announced its vaccine is 95% effective and they're currently seeking regulatory clearance. Moderna announced on Monday its vaccine is 94.1% effective and will also seek re regulatory clearance. The, the British announced today uh, uh, that they're moving forward uh, as well with, the, with their vaccine distribution. This is proof that the public-private partnerships like those in Operation Warp Speed can lead to phenomenal successes in record time. But we know we know a full economic recovery will occur only when Americans can go back to work safely, send their kids back to school confidently, and have easy access to testing and treatments. There's still more work to be done. And, um, and so I do want to go back to our committee jurisdiction, the Treasury and the Fed's decisive actions uh, back in uh, March and April to prevent the worst of this economic crisis and saving millions of jobs. Chairman Powell, the Federal Reserve's emergency lending facilities continue to serve as a strong backstop uh, to our financial markets and, and prevent uh, 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 disorder in the financial markets from impacting our real economy. Uh, those those uh, programs stipulated billions of dollars in private sector lending and successfully operated as lender of last resort. And now uh, they acted as a, that uh, necessary source of liquidity in those urgent times earlier this year. Uh, they ensured the orderly uh, flow of credits and, and the functioning of markets of all sizes, in, including supporting workers and communities across the country. So I want to commend you for that. Um, but they are emergency facilities only, and they're backstops designed to support the functioning of private markets, and they're intended uh, to be a lender of last resort, not to replace private markets. And from the start, I've said that we need to be forward thinking and have a plan to wind down these firefighting measures when appropriate. And so I wanna thank uh, both the Fed and Treasury uh, for uh, having a plan to wind those measures down appropriately as accordance to the CARES Act law. Um, and I also know that, uh, and I will ask you specifically about this, about uh, the additional capacities that you will have with the CARES Act uh, expiring on, on January, uh, on, on December 31st. Uh, additionally, Secretary Mnuchin, thank you for your quick work on the Paycheck Protection Program that supported millions of small businesses. Um, and I know we still need uh, additional relief for more small businesses in different segments. And thank you for continuing to work for a bipartisan agreement here on Capitol Hill. Um, and to, to not play the gamesmanship and partisan games uh, that, uh, that have uh, uh, bedeviled um, 
uh, these talks uh, in the last couple of months. Thank you for, for rising above that. Um, so, but there is still work to be done. And uh, I look forward to us coming together and having a package that can support small businesses and do the responsible things necessary to help uh, rebuild our economy and to protect American citizens' lives. Thanks so much for being here today and I look forward to your testimony. Yield back. Thank you very much. I now recognize the chair of the subcommittee on oversight and investigations, Mr. Green, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the witnesses for appearing as well. Uh, Mr. Mnuchin has made a comment that has caused some deal of concern, indicating that the markets have recovered significantly. This begs the question for my constituents, what markets? The real the metal market, six billion persons about to be evicted, has recovered. The free food market, the food lines have one thing in common. After all the food is gone, the lines are still long. The supermarket, the Market prices there have gone 3.9 percent for the 12 months ending in October. The stock market does not measure certain things that are important to my constituents. Uh, it doesn't measure the hunger pains that my constituents suffer from, depression from evictions. It doesn't measure the working class uncertainty and the coronavirus misery and debt. My concern today is what is your agency doing to help the grim reality of this pandemic for consumers? I look forward to hearing. Thank you very much. I now recognize the subcommittee's ranking member, Mr. Barr, for one minute. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Congress, the Fed, and Treasury acted boldly in the face of the economic turmoil brought on by the COVID pandemic and showcased the true reach of the federal government's response. Through Congress's fiscal policy authority and the Fed's emergency lending facilities, we were able to stabilize markets, keep workers on the job, and ensure the continued functioning of corporate credit markets. As we continue on the path to economic recovery, it's important that we take stock of the tools used. We must evaluate which were effective and which were not, which should be redeployed and which can be wound down, which programs are legally set to expire and which programs should be reauthorized. That is the role of this committee with oversight of the U.S. financial system. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on this and other topics to help inform Congress's continued response to the pandemic. Secretary Mnuchin and Chairman Powell, I commend you on your work to promote economic stability in turbulent times, and I thank you for your service. I yield back. Thank you. I want to welcome today's witnesses to the committee. First, I want to welcome the Honorable Stephen T. Mnuchin. Secretary of the United States Department of the Treasury. He has served in his current position since 2017. Mr. Mnuchin has testified before the committee on previous occasions, and I believe he does not need any further introduction. I also want to welcome our other distinguished witness, the Honorable Jerome Powell, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He has served on the Board of Directors of Governors since 2012 and as its chair since 2018. Chair Powell has previously testified before the committee, and I believe he also does not need any further introduction. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. At that time, I would ask you to wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of the committee members' times. Secretary Mnuchin, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to join you today to discuss the Department of Treasury's unprecedented response to support the American people throughout the pandemic. We continue to work to implement the historic CARES Act with speed, efficiency, and transparency, but our job will not be complete until we get every American back to work. When I last testified before you in September, I stated that America was in the midst of the fastest economic recovery from any crisis. I'm proud to say, while there is still a lot more work to be done, that statement is true. In the third quarter, GDP grew by 33% annually, beating all expectations and a previous record of 1950. 
Americans are getting back to work. The October jobs report showed the economy gained back 12 million jobs since April, more than 50% of all jobs lost due to the pandemic. The unemployment rate has decreased to 6.9%, a rate not expected by the blue chip to be achieved until the fourth quarter of 2021. The historic bipartisan CARES Act provided the economic relief that is critical to supporting the economy recovering. Additional economic slowdowns, however, continue to impair and cause great harm to American business and workers. Based upon the, the recent economic data, I continue to believe that a targeted fiscal package is the most appropriate federal response. I strongly encourage Congress to use the $455 billion in unused funds from the CARES Act to pass an additional bill with bipartisan support. The PPP has unused money of $140 billion that could be sent out the door immediately to support many small businesses. The administration is standing ready to support Congress in this effort to help American workers and small business that continue to struggle with the impact of COVID-19. Treasury has been working hard to implement the CARES Act in a transparent and efficient manner. We've released a significant amount of information on treasury.gov and usaspending.gov. We continue to cooperate with various oversight bodies, including the new special IG, the Treasury IG, the Treasury IG for Tax Administration, the new Congressional Oversight Commission, the GAO. We have provided regular updates to Congress, marking this my ninth appearance before Congress for the CARES Act hearing. We have also devoted significant resources to responding to inquiries from numerous congressional committees and individual members on both sides. We appreciate your interest on these issues and we remain committed to working with you to accommodate Congress's legislative purpose to advance the whole of government approach to defeating COVID-19. Chair Waters, I do want to just respond to your comment where you said I had no justification and made matters worse on my uh, termination of the facilities. I, I just want to emphasize this was not a political decision. I was merely implementing the CARES Act. I'm happy to walk you, your staff, or other members of the committee through section 4029, which makes it very clear. I find it implausible that any member of the committee believed in voting for the CARES Act that you are authorizing me to invest $500 billion in Federal Reserve facilities to make loans and purchase corporate bonds in perpetuity with no expiration date. But that is exactly what you would have to believe if you disagree with my interpretation of congressional intent on the issue. And since I was personally there and negotiated most of these documents, I am very familiar. But if Congress wants to extend this money for federal purposes for these facilities, Congress can add that to new legislation. I'd like to thank the members of the committee for working with us, and I'm pleased to answer any additional questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Mnuchin. Secretary Powell, uh, Chair Powell, uh, you are recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on our ongoing measures to address the hardship brought by the pandemic. Our public health professionals continue to deliver our most important response and we remain grateful for their service. The Federal Reserve, along with others across government, is using its policies to help alleviate the economic burden. Since the pandemic's onset, we have taken forceful actions to provide relief and stability, to ensure that the recovery will be as strong as possible, and to limit lasting damage to the economy. Economic activity has continued to recover from its depressed second quarter level. The reopening of the economy led to a rapid rebound in activity and GDP rose at an annual rate of 33% in the third quarter. In recent months, however, the pace of improvement has moderated. Household spending on goods, especially durable goods, has been strong and has moved above its pre-pandemic level. In contrast, spending on services remains low, largely because of ongoing weakness in sectors that typically require people to gather closely, including travel and hospitality. The overall rebound in household spending is due in part to federal stimulus payments and expanded unemployment benefits, which provided essential support to many families and individuals. In the labor market, more than half of the 22 million jobs that were lost in March and April have been regained, as many people were able to return to work. 
As with overall economic activity, the pace of improvement in the labor market has moderated. Although we welcome this progress, we will not lose sight of the millions of Americans who remain out of work. The economic downturn has not fallen equally on all Americans, and those least able to shoulder the burden have been hardest hit. In particular, the high level of joblessness has been especially severe for lower wage workers in the service sector, for women, and for African Americans and Hispanics. The economic dislocation has upended many lives and created great uncertainty about the future. <clears throat> As we've emphasized throughout the pandemic, the outlook for the economy is extraordinarily uncertain and will depend in large part on the success of efforts to keep the virus in check. The rise in new COVID-19 cases, both here and abroad, is concerning and could prove challenging for the next few months. A full economic recovery is unlikely until people are confident that it's safe to re-engage in a broad range of activities. Recent news on the vaccine front is very positive for the medium term. For now, significant challenges and uncertainties remain, including timing, production and distribution, and efficacy across different groups. It remains difficult to assess the timing and scope of the economic implications of these developments with any degree of confidence. The Fed's response has been guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people, along with our responsibilities to promote the stability of the financial system. We've been taking broad and forceful actions to more directly support the flow of credit in the economy. Our actions taken together have unlocked almost $2 trillion of funding to support businesses large and small, nonprofits, and state and local governments since April. This in turn has helped keep organizations from shuttering and has put employers in both a better position to keep workers on and to hire them back as the economy continues to recover. These programs serve as a backstop to key credit markets and have helped restore the flow of credit from private lenders through normal channels. We've deployed these lending powers to an unprecedented extent. Our emergency lending powers require the approval of the Treasury and are available only in very unusual circumstances, such as those we find ourselves in today. Many of these programs have been supported by funding from the CARES Act, and I have included detailed information about those facilities in my written testimony. The CARES Act assigns sole authority over its funds to the Treasury Secretary, subject to the statute's specified limits. The Secretary has indicated that these limits do not permit the CARES Act-funded facilities to make new loans or purchases or purchase new assets after December 31st of this year. Accordingly, the Fed will return the unused portion of the funds allocated to the lending programs that are backstopped by the CARES Act in connection with their termination at the end of the year. As the Secretary noted in his letter, Non-CARES Act funds in the Exchange Stabilization Fund are available to support emergency lending facilities if they are needed. Everything the Fed does is in service to our public mission. We're committed to using our full range of tools to support the economy and to help assure that the recovery from this difficult period will be as robust as possible on behalf of communities, families, and businesses across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Powell. <clears throat> I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Secretary Mnuchin and Chair Powell, just last month, the Federal Open Market Committee met, and according to the minutes, quote, a few participants noted that it was important to extend uh, the emergency lending facilities beyond year end. That's the quote. A few days later, you, Secretary Mnuchin, requested that the Fed eliminate its CARES Act emergency lending facilities at the end of the year and return $419 billion so that it could not be used in the future. Initially, the Fed resisted publicly, but the next day, Chair Powell, you acquiesced. Secretary Mnuchin, your own Office of Financial Research warned that we should expect, and again, quote, potentially severe losses from bar defaults and bankruptcies, end quote. Moreover, the outlook for states, cities, airports, and hospitals is not good. And despite what President Trump suggests, it is not limited to blue states. For example, the day after New York State's credit was downgraded, Mississippi's credit was downgraded, with the pandemic worse than at any point since it began. It is foolish and reckless to take away emergency lending options at this time. 
Secretary Mnuchin, you agree, uh, you argue rather, it was congressional intent for these Fed facilities to be shut down at the end of the year. But the law does not say that. And even the actions of my Republican colleagues belie that novel interpretation. Senator McConnell filed a COVID-19 bill that would change the law to require the Fed to close all of its facilities after January 19, 2021. So if law already required this, this bill wouldn't be necessary. The CARES Act was passed to stabilize the economy during the entirety of the pandemic, not until uh, the end of your tenure as Treasury Secretary. Secretary Mnuchin, it was reported last week that you intend to transfer the unused portion of the CARES Act, that $500 billion appropriation to Treasury's general fund so that the next secretary can have access to the funds. However, Section 4027 of the CARES Act explicitly states that funds may only be transferred on January 1st, 2026, not before January 1, 2026. What you're doing is contrary to what is lawful, and it puts our entire economy in jeopardy. And what's more, it has also been reported that you're working with Director Calabria of the Federal Housing Finance Agency to sell off the government stakes in the housing giants. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, likely destabilizing the entire housing market in the next few months. As I understand it, Secretary Mnuchin, the Obama administration showed you every courtesy when your team was taking the reins. Similarly, the Bush administration worked closely with President Obama's incoming team during the financial crisis, even before he was sworn in. They did so because they were honoring uh, the decision of the American electorate. Tell me, Secretary Mnuchin and Chair Powell, does the Secretary's expected successor, Janet Yellen, support what you're doing? Does she agree that the emergency lending facilities are not needed even though thousands of people are dying each day? Millions more are being infected each week. Tens of thousands of small businesses are closing permanently, and our cities and states are struggling. Does Yellen support Director Calabria's plans to fundamentally remake the housing markets where millions of people are struggling to pay their mortgage and rent each month? Secretary Mnuchin. So again, let me first comment on, and in all due respect, uh, I believe I am following the law. Section 4029 makes very clear on December 31st, 2020, that the authority provided under new loans, guarantees, or investments shall terminate. Thank you now, very much. I'm going to reclaim to, my time. And do you agree? Uh, to where the funds do you agree, go, Mr. Think, Powell? Again, the funds, let me just continue. The, the transfer of the funds is not up to me. When funds come back, they go into as Reclaiming my time, I need to have an answer from Mr. Powell. Right. Do you agree with Secretary Mnuchin? The Secretary has sole authority over the CARES Act funding under the CARES Act. The, the Fed is not involved in that. His reading of the law, thus, is the authoritative one, and we accept it. I would also just say if I was politically motivated, I wouldn't have extended the four facilities in deference to the Fed's view that were non-CARES Act facilities. So had I been trying to be political, I would have Well, thank you. Those. My time has expired. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. Well, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, let, let me just give you a moment to answer. It sounds like you have additional, additional things you want to explain and your reading of the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act expires on uh, December 31st of this year. Uh, that is in the law. Uh, so let, let me give you the opportunity to give a full answer on your decision with the um, exchange stabilization funds. So th thank you very much. There's three sections I direct people to, 4029, <clears throat> which is the termination date of December 31st of 2020 to make new loans, loan guarantees, or other investments shall terminate. That's perfectly clear. There's section 4003, 
which references deposit of proceeds. So when proceeds come in, we allocate proceeds, whether it's the return of an airline loan or money from the Fed, we allocate it very clearly in Section 4003. There's also, as the <coughs> Chair referenced, Section 4027, which references if there was money left over, okay, and there's limited uses of what that money can be, either expenses or follow-on investments, to uh, on, on existing loans. So if we had to make an advance on an investing loan to an airline, that's under 4027, and any money on 2026 will come back vis-a-vis -vis that. So again, uh, section 4003, section 4027, section 4029, and again, I personally negotiated this language. Uh, and again, Congress and has the ability to change this if they think the money should be spent otherwise. Secretary Mnuchin, you and I uh, talked regularly during those negotiations. I was a strong advocate for as large a, an exchange stabilization fund uh, dollar amount as possible so that uh, both the Treasury and the Federal Reserve would have maximum firepower to put out um, what we did not fully understand um, would be would would happen in the in the coming weeks or coming months with the nature of the virus, um, and so we in the in the midst of this negotiation had a very very large exchange stabilization fund. Uh, absent the CARES 454 billion dollars in the exchange stabilization fund, how how many dollars uh, are uh, allocated to the exchange stabilization fund? Again, we, we allocated uh, something like $20 billion from the ESF for the pre-CARES facilities prior to the CARES Act. As I said, in deference to the Fed, those facilities don't have this restriction and still exist. And there, there's still something like, you know, an additional $50 billion that could be used in the future for emergencies, which would support another $500 billion. And, and again, I, I want to okay. thank Congress for giving extraordinary authority to the Secretary of the Treasury for $500 billion. As people have noted, many people criticized uh, that authority, and I'm merely following the law and returning uh, that authority back as Congress intended. So, uh, Chairman Powell, uh, these facilities of the Fed uh, served a very important purpose in the early days. Their utilization in recent months had not significantly changed in dollar value of uh, Fed lending facilities. Um, and so the four remaining facilities uh, are, are still important as a lender of last resort facility, of course. Um, and so I, I wanna thank you for your work um, to, uh, to stand up those facilities and, and your work in the last, um, uh, in the last uh, eight months of this year to stand up more Facilities that were stood up in the fullness of the, la of the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, you, you stood up more facilities in eight months, uh, well, actually in three months than they did in four years. So thank you to you, the staff of the Federal Reserve, for their solid, uh, great work to support our economy and to ensure that this health crisis that's become an economic crisis did not become a financial crisis. I want to commend you for that. Finally, I, I want to note um, that I, I have consistently been an advocate of the independence of the Federal Reserve for making monetary policy and supporting our economy. Uh, I do think it's important, an important hallmark, whether it was uh, Chair Yellen in your seat, uh, Chairman Powell, um, or your service as Chairman of the Federal Reserve, that we honor the, uh, the independent policy making. Um, and monetary policy decisions of the Federal Reserve. And I want to thank you for your leadership. Yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas, who is also the Vice Chair of the Committee on Financial Services, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairman Powell and uh, Secretary Mnuchin, thank you so much for making time to be with us here today. Um, I wanted to uh, open with some questions regarding the Main Street Lending Program, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you, uh, are you familiar with how much has been um, authorized uh, for the uh, MSLP at this time? Yes, I am. We, we made about $5 billion in loans, a little bit of $5 billion in loans. 
Okay, so we have about five billion out there in MSLP. Now that those um those programs are administered by participating uh, banks. That's correct. Yes. Well, are we, the we, banks, we work put it this um, way: we work through the banking system. We access borrowers through the banking system. You know, we we administer the overall program, but the banks are facing off against the actual borrowers. Right, and um, and so these borrowers that are get um receiving these MSLP funds, are they required to uh, be investment grade borrowers? No. And that, that, that uh, just brings me full circle, Mr. Chairman, because the last we spoke, I was discussing the municipal liquidity facility and the um, Fed's inability to uh, allow municipalities that are below investment grade to be able to access that liquidity. And it was mentioned in our hearings that the uh, Federal Reserve does not provide funding to non-investment grade entities. And yet through the MSLP, indirectly, the Federal Reserve, as you've mentioned, is willing to do so for private sector entities. So as you'll recall, we, um, the, the, um, the territories, there are no investment grade uh, overall sovereign uh, investment grade, but we worked with you in your office to, to work with uh, one of the below sovereign level facilities, the, the name of it doesn't come to mind. And we also worked with you to, to be in touch with the Treasury Department under various loan programs that might be useful. But no, we, we uh, the overwhelming majority of, um, of municipal borrowers are investment grade, and we did limit the facility to that. Well, the reason why I'm raising this point, Mr. Chairman, is because I just wanted to highlight the um, inconsistency in the policy because if investment grade is a requirement for the Federal Reserve to be providing financial support, particularly as the lender of last resort, um, and it's not, and it's not uh, imposing that same requirement on private sector entities that are accessing the MSLP, uh, I again beg the question, why are we doing so for municipal entities trying to access the municipal liquidity facility? I appreciate your staff trying to work with us in looking for workarounds um, in this um, environment. But I mean, it's just so glaring, Mr. Chairman, that um, these private companies are not investment grade. They're able to access the support. I'm glad they are. I want them to. But we're not allowing municipal um, entities who are not investment grade to be able to access the specific facilities that we set up for our municipal, um, our municipal circumstances. So I just wanted to put that on the record, Mr. Chairman. I'm hoping that you guys can again go back to the table and reconsider this given, given these, uh, these issues that we're bringing to light. And uh, at the end of the day, we need a solution for our municipal um, entities that are below investment grade, but are in the same boat as all of these private sector entities that are able to access capital through the MSLP. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, welcome, Secretary Mnuchin and uh, Chairman Powell. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank you both, uh, both of you and your, your staff, uh, for your service to, uh, to our nation and your tireless efforts during this pandemic to implement the CARES Act, uh, and for propping up the Federal Reserve's emergency lending facility. While economic data continues to trend in a positive direction, and we do know that, uh, that a credible and safe uh, vaccines are just weeks away, the surge in cases and lockdowns occurring across the country could result in our economy uh, backsliding again if we do nothing. I want to reiterate the urgency, the overdue urgency for Congress to provide immediate targeted relief now, not next year, should have been months and months ago. Our nation's hospitals, small businesses, uh, schools, many of our hardest hit industries, and certainly the uh, continued unemployed cannot continue to wait any longer for relief. Just this week, St. Louis County, which I have the privilege of representing, reported an average of 660 new cases being added every day, with a total of 51,324 confirmed coronavirus cases as of Sunday. 
many of my constituents in Missouri's second districts are under mask mandates and restaurants and bars have been completely shuttered and are closed down. Capacity limits uh, of gatherings are down to 10. Uh, our families and our businesses are asking Congress for additional relief to combat this health crisis. Hospitals are filling up and many businesses are worried that they will not survive. They are reaching the desperation point. We must stop playing partisan politics and come to a bipartisan agreement to provide a direct COVID-related um, stimulus and support now. Chairman Powell, according to the data you are seeing, what parts of our economy are most in need of fiscal stimulus uh, measures provided by, by Congress? Thank you. Uh, I think there are many sectors that could use some help, and of course those decisions are, are really up to you and the administration, but I'll just mention quickly, uh, I would start with the labor market. <clears throat> I think we ought to remember that despite the rapid progress in getting people back to work, which is so welcome, there's still 10 million people who are out of work yes. because of the pandemic, and uh, you know that's, that's more than lost their jobs in all of the global financial crisis 10 years ago, which at the time was the biggest you know, uh, uh, recession that we'd had in a long, long time. So. There's a lot of work left to do there. The unemployment insurance programs are expiring at year end. I think that's an area where I would certainly look. Another that comes up all the time in our discussions is smaller businesses. And uh, what, you know, we, we, we met with a group of uh, com community bankers uh, a week or so ago, and, and they were telling us there, there are just a lot of smaller businesses in their communities that will struggle to make it through this winter. Because as you say, in Missouri Second District, it's true, it's true all over the country. COVID is moving up, um, and uh, the, the cold weather, people are staying in, and it's gonna be tough on a lot of small businesses. So that's another place where I would look. The last is, um, I do think um, uh, state and local governments, uh, um, and it, this differs state to state, but they, they've had revenue, you know, revenues down, and, and uh, maybe not so much in some states, but in some states by a lot, but costs going up. And I think that they deliver critical services. They're, they're living under balanced budget requirements. And so they lay people off and they've laid off more than a million people already. So that's another area where I think it would be profitable to look. Thank you, I appreciate that. Secretary uh, Mnuchin, I'll ask you uh, a similar question. You've mentioned the need for a targeted fiscal package with uh, $455 billion in funds from the CARES Act. Uh, that, that did need to be returned to Treasury given the law. Um, how do you suggest we try and tap or reappropriate this money to support the most vulnerable sectors of our economy? Uh, my, my single highest priority would be to activate the $140 billion in PPP funds that are not spent that we could immediately send out to the hardest hit small businesses whose revenue is down dramatically. Uh, I also think Congress should consider extending some of the unemployment uh, insurance programs that expire at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. And uh, the Paycheck Protection Program is estimated to have saved more than 50 million jobs, including many jobs across Missouri 2nd Congressional District. The gentle lady's uh, time has expired. The I gentleman you, from uh, Illinois, Mr. Caston, is recognized for five minutes. I'm sorry, it took a little bit of time to get off mute there. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate you all being here today. Was, uh, I was really pleased that the Federal Reserve's financial stability report identified climate change as a risk to financial stability. The, uh, the report stated that, uh, quote, different sectors of the economy and geographic regions face different risks that will diverge from historical patterns. It also said that levered financial institutions may be exposed to losses from disasters made more likely by climate change. Chairman Powell, uh, while there's more to explore about how to incorporate these risks into modeling, do you think it is appropriate for financial institutions to incorporate climate risk into credit risk assessment? Uh, let me say this, uh, to, for starters, it, climate change is an important issue. 
I want to say that uh, society's broad response to climate change really has to come from elected representatives. I think there is a role for the Fed here, and we're, we're working our way through understanding what that will be. But one, one thing is the public will expect that in our supervision and regulation of financial institutions and financial market infrastructure, that they will be resilient. We'll make sure that they are resilient to climate change risks. And I do think that, that it does fall on banking institutions and uh, CCPs and other financial market infrastructures to evaluate that and incorporate, incorporate uh, in their own operations. And also, uh, I would think, ultimately, in, in, in the credit that, that, that they extend. Uh, so I think I'll take that as a yes, because I was, I was really discussing it's appropriate for financial institutions to incorporate. What role the Fed has is, of course, a separate question. Um, I certainly agree with you, and, and I ask the question because I am really concerned with the OCC's latest rule that would prevent banks from integrating climate-related risks into their credit assessments despite the fairly significant financial risk that climate poses. The OCC rule specifically says that the risks of lending, quote, would not change based on the sector in which the firm operates, which is categorically false. I don't know how you would, how you would tell banks that somehow they need to ignore the dynamics in a sector without imposing significant systemic risk um, on, on the banking sector, um, not allowing banks to account for the sector of the economy where it sits and just defies logic and market fundamentals. Um, the report also stated that within the financial system, increased transparency through improved measurement and disclosure would improve the pricing of climate risks. What additional transparency would be helpful to appropriately assess the overall risk of the financial system due to climate change? So as you, as you can tell, and I'm, I'm glad you read that uh, box in our financial stability report, um, we're really at the beginning of, of the process of thinking our way through these things, and so are other market regulators and central banks and financial institutions around the world. So. Um, the point there was that we need, we're going to need transparency uh, about, about how financial institutions are thinking about these risks, how they're incorporating it in their business model. We don't actually regulate uh, transparency, you know, we, or we, that's really more of a market regulator job, is to, what, what is the required disclosure? And I think we're all moving in that direction, but it's, it is, in terms of um, the interaction between financial regulators and financial institutions, we're, we're at the beginning of the work. Would, would a standardization of climate-related risk disclosures from publicly traded companies be useful for you in order to continue that work? No, I, th I think that's certainly where we're headed over time. Again, again that's not our responsibility. That would be the, 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 uh, the market regulator's responsibility, but it, I do think that's, that's where we'll be going. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Powell, uh, some in the press this morning and, and some of my colleagues have seemed to uh, try to um, uh, make the argument that, that you and the Treasury Secretary are in disagreement about the Exchange Stabilization Fund. I don't, I don't detect much of a disagreement. What I, what I hear the Secretary say is that uh, that his decision to not extend the $430 billion left in the Exchange Stabilization Fund is, is rooted in his interpretation of the statute of the CARES Act. And I, I, what I heard you say is that, uh, that you believe that the Secretary under the law has, a, has the authoritative <clears throat> interpretation of that and you accept that. Um, now, obviously, you stated yesterday that <clears throat> you think it's <clears throat> perhaps premature to be pulling back from emergency lending programs, but uh, I hear uh, the Treasury Secretary say that it's within uh, Congress's ability to, to authorize that. So I don't see a disagreement here. But given the, the modest take up in some of the emergency lending programs, particularly Main Street, uh, wouldn't it be wise for Congress to repurpose at least some of that $430 billion towards uh, what admittedly has been an effective program, the, the Paycheck Protection Program? I hope you won't mind if I use uh, just a couple seconds to clarify the, the sure. what's going on. So, as I said earlier, <clears throat> the Secretary has sole authority over CARES Act funds. He reads the statute and reads it to say that there's no, uh, no support for lending after December 31. We accept that. We don't have a role in reading it. And uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the, 
our thinking is, is not about the CARES Act money. It is more about support for the economy. Sure. We were concerned that the public might misinterpret this as the Fed stepping back and thinking that our work is done, and that, that's very much not the case. So we needed to send a signal to the public that, to that effect. And sure. it, as the Secretary pointed out in his letter, as we pointed out in our letter, there is exchange stabilization fund money that's available to, right. su to, to support the reestablishment of these facilities or other facilities if they are needed and, and, and you know, they meet the legal requirements and that kind of thing. Let me just, just ask this, though. Wouldn't it be wise for Congress at this point, before the end of the year, to repurpose some of those <clears throat> CARES Act funds uh, towards the Paycheck Protection Program, given the concerns of the small businesses that you referenced? I would just say that I, I you know, what I'm hearing from across, across the aisle and on both sides of the Hill is the desire to do something to, to fund these, these causes that the Secretary just talked about and, and others, and I think, I think that would certainly be a help for the economy. As to where that money comes from, that's really up to you. Well, one area where there's, I think, significant bipartisan support is for streamlining the forgiveness process. Um, a recent stur survey uh, in Kentucky found that 27 percent of community banks in Kentucky would not participate in a new round of PPP without streamlined forgiveness and clear rules of the road. Many of the businesses in, in my district uh, who have applied for forgiveness tell me that the process from the SBA is slow and cumbersome. It's a big problem if lenders will not participate in a second round because of uh, inadequate streamlining of the forgiveness rules. Um, Secretary Mnuchin, you previously indicated your support for legislation to streamline PPP forgiveness. Is this still the case? And what more can we do to ensure participation by community lenders in a new round of PPP? Uh, I do support that. And we've created three different <clears throat> forms for forgiveness uh, using what authorities we have and uh, making it as simple as possible for loans that are less than 50000 But I know there is bipartisan support to pass a bill, I believe it's all loans, 150000 or less, and, and we fully support that subject to audit. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, the statutory language in the CARES Act temporarily suspends accounting rules related to troubled debt restructurings, uh, and that expires on December 31st. It's important that Congress extend this important tool uh, to allow uh, lenders to continue to work with their customers. What authorities do you have at the Fed to extend uh, TDR relief administratively versus what Congress must do to ensure lenders can continue to accommodate borrowers? So we actually don't have authority to extend TDR. It's an accounting rule. Um, we, we have a lot of authority, though, and we will use it to make sure that, that uh, banks continue to work with their, with their borrowers and encourage them to do so, I should say. Um, there's some uncertainty among the auditing community about whether life insurers would qual qualify for TDR relief under CARES. Uh, this is a problem because insurers make up over 13 percent of the commercial real estate lending market, uh, a sector that's deeply impacted by the pandemic. Mayor Powell, do you agree that life insurers, given their participation in the commercial real estate lending market, should qualify for TDR relief? Uh, I'd have to go check on that one. I'll come back to you. Thanks. Okay. We think that's, that's an important thing to, to look into. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gothheimer, is no, uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell and Secretary Mnuchin, for being here today. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we've been talking about, has caused ongoing global health and economic crisis. Certain aspects of our economy are recovering. Millions of Americans and thousands of my constituents are in dire need of help. We can't go home uh, from Washington with, with giving, given what's going on and without risking a double-dip recession. As you said earlier this month, Chairman Powell, further support is likely to be needed to avoid another spread of the virus and help individuals. We're obviously in a lame duck session of Congress. The American people have waited long enough. Our families, our businesses, and our communities are all suffering, and it would be unconscionable for any party to walk away from so many who are hurting right now. Yesterday, the Problem Solvers Caucus joined a bipartisan group of senators in releasing a new $908 billion emergency short-term stimulus package. It is intended to be a critical down payment to get through the next months. If I can start with you, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, have, have you had a chance to uh, review the framework by chance? Well, first, let me just say, I really appreciate the work that you have personally done and the problem solvers have done in trying to reach bipartisan solutions. Uh, I, I did review it briefly yesterday after my testimony, and I'll be spending more time on it today. Uh, again, I would, I would urge Congress to move quickly on the PPP, which there seems to be enormous bipartisan support. But again, thank you personally for your efforts. 
Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and, and I appreciate the work we've done together on this. And obviously, I hope this would be something that if we can get the support here that the administration might support. Um, uh, can you, uh, if I could turn to Chairman Powell, uh, would you speak to the urgency for fiscal relief and, and what do you believe is at stake this winter for the economy and for families if we don't get an emergency package done in the next uh, week? My, my view would be that um, it would be very helpful and very important that uh, there be additional fiscal support for the economy uh, really to get us through the, the, um, the winter. This, um, we've, had, we've made a lot of progress faster than we expected, and uh, now we have a big spike in COVID cases, and uh, it, it, um, it, it may weigh on economic activity. People may pull back from activities that were being involved in or, or not engage in new activities. So I think it would be helpful uh, if, if we could get that done, if you could get that done. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just follow up on that. Um, obviously, local governments are struggling through no fault of their own. It's putting law enforcement, firefighters, teachers, uh, and their pay on the line. Uh, what do you think the impact would be if we can't get extra resources to our state and local governments on the economy? Um, so this is, these are really decisions for you, but I, I would say that um, state and local governments provide uh, critical services. You mentioned them and state and local governments live with balanced budget uh, requirements, unlike the federal government. And so what happens when, uh, when revenues soften and expenses go up is you see layoffs. And that was a big part of the story in the slow recovery from the global financial crisis a decade ago. We now have a little more than a million in, um, in layoffs so far. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it would be important to um, State and local governments are, are one of the very largest employers in the country, and they provide those critical services. I, I think that's a, a worthy place for you to look in terms of uh, where support might be appropriate. Do you see it as sort of, uh, just to follow up on that point, a, a ripple effect? You've got in, in New Jersey, about a third of our businesses already, small businesses have already gone out, including about 28 percent of restaurants. When you add that with the, with the revenue declines for the state and local governments and all this is coming out, what do you see on the other side of the virus? We're going to get through with the vaccine, but what what could be the, the economic uh, uh, this that this brings along after uh, after the virus uh, is behind us? So I think, as you suggest, it's a you have a near term and medium term difference. The near term does look challenging through the winter. Small businesses we're hearing all over that uh, small businesses are really under pressure, um, uh, and then sometime in the middle of next year, it really does look like. That may be the light at the end of the tunnel, we all hope so, and that the economy could be, could be very healthy. The problem is, of course, people who lose their homes now or, or businesses that go out of business, these are, these are sometimes small businesses that might have generations of, you know, uh, of, of sort of human capital built up in, in, in their activities. And once they're gone, they, they, they can't just be recreated. So you could lose, um, parts of the economy, and that will, that will mean a slower recovery. And so I think, I mean, I like to think of it as a bridge over this chasm that was created by the, uh, by the pandemic, you know, and we're trying to get as much of the economy and as many of the workers across that bridge to the post-pandemic economy, and we've done, I think, well at that, but there's still some work left to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. The I gentleman's time. time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing, and thank you both for, for all your work uh, throughout this pandemic. I, I sincerely believe that we'll look back a decade, two decades from now, uh, and, and the work that you two did together uh, will be looked at in the most favorable light. Uh, and so I, I couldn't be more grateful for your service, so thank you both for that. Um, look, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel with, with two vaccines uh, awaiting approval. And I think the, the bridge comment is exactly correct. Uh, we're, we're looking to bridge from now until, call it, you know, April 1st or whenever that is. Um, and I was pleased to, to join a group of bipartisan and bicameral members yesterday, as, as my colleague, Mr. Gottheimer, just, just mentioned, uh, with the Problem Solvers Caucus to, to hopefully provide that bridge. Uh, and, and I hope we'll be able to do that. Um, Mr. Powell, Chairman Powell, bef before I, I move into some questions on that, um, Going back to the Exchange Stabilization Fund a bit, 
the, the main purpose was to provide liquidity to the financial system and to stabilize the financial system. Um, as these programs expire, uh, do you see the same or similar risks to the liquidity inside the financial system as you did, say, back in March or April, or do we feel like we're in a much better place today? Yeah. We're clearly in a much better place. I mean, to be, to be clear, the utilization in these facilities, most of them, has, is very, very low now. Nonetheless, the, we, think, we see them as serving a backstop function, and that backstop function, you know, our, our, a central banker would want to, and we would want to leave that backstop in function, function in place for some additional period of time, but not forever. You know, we, if you look back at what we did in the global financial crisis, we left them out there until the, we were well past the difficulty, and then we put them, unplugged them, put them in the attic, and, and put them away. None of them are a permanent feature of the landscape, and we hope these don't either. So that's the way we think about it. Thank you. That's helpful. And hopefully as we debate a, a next package, uh, we can consider that. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, in, in recent months we've heard Speaker Pelosi on multiple occasions state effectively that nothing is better than something uh, with, with respect to additional relief. Um, in your estimation, uh, is nothing better than something uh, for my constituents back home? No. Something is clearly better than nothing. And again, I would urge Congress to do something if it's just the PPP or more. And of course, that's an obvious statement, which I think everybody knows. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, this, the speaker has, has chosen that path. Um, my understanding is you have continued dialogue with her. Um, I'm not going to ask you to, to divulge sort of specifics of those conversations, but you've been involved in a lot of deals in your life, uh, certainly as, as Treasury Secretary. Uh, as you've had these discussions, how would you characterize them with respect to willingness to actually get a deal done? Because I think th there's a lot of people who, who like to talk around here, um, but when it gets down to it, actually don't do that much with respect to, to closing the deal. Um, how would you characterize the discussions? Well, I would say the good news is when we really needed to get this done uh, last March, it, it got done with overwhelming bipartisan support. Republicans and Democrats came together in an unprecedented response. Uh, when we needed to extend the PPP, people came together in an unprecedented response. Uh, unfortunately, since that period of time, uh, things that, in my opinion, th there should be absolute bipartisan support and we could get done. Unfortunately, uh, the speaker has had, you know, a, a half a loaf is not good enough and wanted a full loaf. So again, I would encourage Congress particularly over the next few weeks in the lame duck, let's try to get something done. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, again, to state another obvious point, um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are in the majority. Uh, and in order for this to actually get done, uh, we're all gonna have to come together to do it, but really the pressure needs to come from them. Uh, and, and I hope that, that they will use the leverage that they have to encourage the speaker to put a real bipartisan bill forward uh, because, as Chairman Powell said, as you said, as common sense demands, uh, it is obvious that we need a bridge here. There are people struggling. There are small businesses struggling. There are people who are unemployed who are struggling. Uh, and I can almost guarantee you to the person uh, that every single one of them would prefer something to nothing. Uh, and, and I hope uh, that this body will come to common sense uh, and actually get that done. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. And I object to all of the fault being placed on the speaker's back. I would advise the president to get involved and get off the golf course. Ms. Acting, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you both for being here. Uh, as we all know, we're in uh, dire straits right now. Iowa's now had increasing unemployment claims for six straight weeks. And I, of course, I'd like to remind everybody that we need to pay attention to the level of unemployment, not just the direction. This is all happening when week after week we see initial claims higher than the ones that we saw in the Great Recession. That's 36 weeks in a row where we've seen record unemployment claims across this country. Meanwhile, the Century Foundation recently estimated 12 million people would lose their unemployment benefits um, the day after Christmas if we don't act. Um, that seems very terrible for this country. Chairman Powell, what are the economic impacts of removing that support at a time when this recovery is so fragile? So this is if the unemployment um, 
uh, programs run out and expire at the end of the year, I, you know, we would be concerned that um, uh, the unemployment rate for people in the bottom quartile, for example, is about 20 percent still, and those are people with relatively low savings, low wealth, and we would be concerned that they'd be vulnerable to, uh, you know, losing their houses and, and, or, or, their, or their rental and just be in a very difficult place. So um, we, we think that's an appropriate place to look for, uh, for further help. Well, I appreciate that. Um, as we all know, one in eight Americans are going hungry. More than three million businesses have closed, and we're approaching 100,000 people now uh, hospitalized with COVID. So I'm wondering for either one of you, does seeing this kind of need and the discussion that we've had today show the importance of passing another COVID aid package? And, and how quickly do, you need, do we need to get that done? I, I would just uh, urge as... Uh as the secretary has done, uh, that uh, this is this is a good time. This would really help the economy uh, through these uh, these winter months and beyond. And um, we, again, we can see uh, the we can see the vaccines coming, but we have a we have a bit more of the bridge to, to build. And uh, I think it would be very important for the economy to receive that help. And I, I would agree with that, as I've echoed. Thank you. And Secretary Mnuchin, I did want to discuss the CDC's eviction moratorium that currently expires on December 31st. Um, a study recently showed 40, 430,000 cases of COVID and more than 10,000 deaths are due to lifting the earlier state and local eviction moratorium. Are there plans to extend that to possibly protect 10 million households from eviction this January? Well, as I, th I think as you know, that wasn't our first choice. Our first choice was really uh, assistance to those people. But I, I will discuss that with the president and extending it and Chair Waters. Uh, I have been speaking to the president every day and updating him on the state of the negotiations. He would like us to see additional funding. Thank you. I hope we can get that done quickly. We don't have uh, so that we don't have a 20 day gap here where millions of people are going to get evicted. So please get back to us and the chairwoman on what we can expect from that. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to discuss what you're doing with the four hundred fifty billion dollars of funds for the CARES Act. I know we've had some discussion here. Um, I'm going to set aside the question of whether or what you're doing is legal because I want to get into why you're doing this. One explanation I've seen is that because you think Congress should use this for fiscal aid, and I don't disagree with that. The problem with this, though, is that if Congress wants to reappropriate money from the Exchange Stabilization Fund, we can do that the same as we can from the General Fund. So the only real difference I can see is that leaving it in the ESF makes it a heck of a lot easier for a future Treasury Secretary to use this money quickly to provide for economic support. So why are you choosing to make it harder to support the economy in the future? I, I just want to clarify, because there's a bunch of confusion, whether it sits in the general account, whether it sits in the ESF, all of this is completely governed by the law. And as I've said, uh, the chair, uh, in deference to him, I extended the pre-CARES Act facilities. If I was looking to do something that was political, I wouldn't have extended those. My My results in not extending the CARES Act is merely an administration of my obligation under this law. It doesn't matter what account it's in. That has nothing to do. The money is administered pursuant to the law. And if Congress wants to change the law, that, that's fine. And the reason why I believe Mitch McConnell has put some new language in isn't in, in my interpretation of the law. It's because many of you seem to be confused that he wants to clarify it. Reclaiming my time. Thank you, uh, Secretary, but that's just not accurate. The CARES Act is very clear that existing investments can remain there, and that's what you've made happen with the Fed's facilities. So that answer isn't acceptable. Why are you looking for a way not to help American people right now? This isn't your money. It's taxpayer money, and it should be quickly available to American people right now when we need the help. So I see you undermining the American people on your way out the door. You need to reverse this decision so that these programs... The gentle lady's time has people. expired. Thank you for your service and I'll back. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters and, and Ranking Member McHenry. And I thank uh, you, uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Chair Powell, for being here today and for this third oversight hearing required by the CARES Act. 
I want to thank you also for the great work by both the Department of the Treasury and Federal Reserve throughout this pandemic response. Your fast action has allowed businesses in my district in Tennessee and across the country as well to keep their doors open and employees on the payroll. I also want to underscore the importance and impact of the CARES Act on stabilizing the economy. We continue to see strong economic recovery, and I hope we can continue that trend as we work towards the great American comeback. Congress has already provided approximately $1 trillion through bipartisan legislation, including the CARES Act, to stabilize state and local economies and support communities, including frontline workers, teachers, students, school employees, and employers and employees. In your testimony, you pointed out that $455 billion in unused funds remain from the CARES Act. Back in Tennessee, folks are talking about how these funds sit unused while House Democrats continue to discuss spending an additional $3.4 trillion, and that is with a T, trillion, in the HEROES Act. In Middle Tennessee, there have been several industries that are enjoying their best year ever while others have been completely devastated by the government-imposed shutdowns due to the coronavirus pandemic. The American private bus and motor coach industry is one of the latter. The motor coach industry plays a vital role in our travel, tourism, and music industries and provides nearly 60 million, or I'm sorry, 600 million passenger trips per year. In the wake of the pandemic, Nearly all of the 3,000 companies in the industry at some point were completely shut down. 36,000 vehicles were parked, and most of the over 88,000 employees were laid off. We have billions of dollars sitting unused, and yet this industry still needs relief. Congress must act to provide targeted relief. Secretary Mnuchin, as a proponent yourself of targeted relief, can you detail what you would do to provide targeted aid to this devastated industry? Yes, and, and let me just say there's more than the 450 billion unused. There's actually another 140 billion in PPP on top of that. But I, I would support $20 billion in additional money in payroll support to the airlines, uh, identical to what we've done before in the CARES Act. Uh, I think it would be very meaningful to, in terms of employment and saving the industry. And I appreciate that, but unfortunately, that assistance didn't reach the motor coach industry, and so they have not had enjoyed that same targeted relief that we saw go to the airline industry. Do you believe that uh, the aid that you described should be included in an end-of-year package? I, I apologize. I, I thought you were asking about the airline, so I, I, I would support additional aid to motor coach as well. Thank you. Lastly, would you be willing to commit to having Treasury staff brief my staff and Senator Marsha Blackburn's staff before the end of the year on ways that Treasury might be able to provide target assistance to the bus and motor coach industry using any existing funds? We'd be happy to. I don't think, unfortunately, we can use existing funds, but we'd be more than happy to go through that with your staff. Thank you. Thanks to President uh, Trump's Operation Warp Speed and the great American innovative industries that we have, we are getting closer and closer to widely distributing a vaccine. In Tennessee, if the FDA authorizes emergency use, we are expecting to see distribution beginning in December. Chair Powell, could you speak to the effect distributing an effective vaccine would have on our economy? Yes. Uh, clearly, in the, in the medium term, which is to say uh, sometime in the middle of next year, we're, we're not well positioned to give a precise estimate of when that might be, people uh, will regain confidence that, it's, that they can gather in uh, various activities that now seem too risky because of COVID, and that'll have a, a, a very positive effect on, on economic activity, on spending, on hiring. So we, we, we do see uh, very positive things coming. Uh, I, I just would add, though, as I said in my testimony, the, the uh, sort of path is a little bit uncertain because, um, you know, we're st we'll st we'll st we are still learning, going to be learning about the efficacy of the, uh, of the uh, vaccines and also about the speed of the rollout and who will get them and in what order and what the effect will be on the public. But overall, uh, I think we see a very positive uh, 
set of developments coming uh, at, at a somewhat uncertain time, but n not so long into the future. The gentleman's Thank time you, has uh, expired. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Porter, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Chair Powell, would you say the economic crisis caused by the pandemic is over? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear exactly what you said. I apologize. That's okay. Would you say the economic crisis caused by the pandemic is over? No, I would not. Okay. How long do you think it'll take? before we know? Uh, I think, well, it, well, before we know, I think we'll know a lot uh, in the next uh, four to six months about vaccines. But the, the real issue, though, is what are going to be the effects of people who, whose jobs may have changed or gone away? It's really the, the new, the post-pandemic economy is going to be different. And we're going to learn a lot about that in the second half of next year. And I, I think those people are going to need help, some of them. And I think that's, Chair Powell, a very fair answer. Um, we can't know unless we have a crystal ball exactly how the recovery from this is going to proceed. Now, Secretary Mnuchin, who's also here with us today, he apparently disagrees with you. In fact, Secretary Mnuchin is so certain that the economic crisis is over that he wants to ban the Fed from using any more of the $500 billion that Congress set aside in the CARES Act to help the economy. Two weeks ago, he wrote to you to request that you return the remaining $455 billion because our economy, in his opinion, simply doesn't need it anymore. In response, you, Chair Powell, said that the outlook for the economy is extraordinarily uncertain. The Federal Reserve would prefer that the full suite of emergency facilities established during the pandemic continue to serve their important role as a backstop for our still strained and vulnerable economy. Needless to say, it's highly concerning that, two, that the two people tasked with stabilizing our economy do not agree on whether the markets are stable. But it actually doesn't matter what either of you two think because Secretary Mnuchin simply doesn't have the authority to recall the $455 billion. I'm reading aloud now from Section 4027 of the CARES Act. On or after January 1, 2026, any funds that are remaining shall be transferred to the general fund. In other words, set, set back to the Treasury. Secretary Mnuchin, is it currently the year 2026, yes or no? First element, I do believe there's an economic emergency. You're putting words in my mouth that are not correct. Second of all, okay, uh, the answer is that 4027. The time belongs to the Madam gentle lady. Chair, reclaiming my time, Mr. Mnuchin, do you start by asking, answering my first question, and I will ask you others. Is today 20, the year 2026, yes or no? Of course it's not 2026. How ridiculous to ask me that question and waste our time. Well, Secretary Mnuchin, I think it's ridiculous that you're play acting to be a lawyer when you well, have... I, actually, I have plenty of lawyers at the Department of Treasury who advise me, so uh, I'm more than Mr. happy Mnuchin, to... I'm more than happy to follow up with Chair Waters and explain all the legal provisions and the ranking member, so more than happy to Secretary make that Mnuchin, access. Secretary Mnuchin, are you in fact a lawyer? not have a legal degree. I have lawyers that report to me. Thank you. Um, Chair Powell, are you, in fact, a lawyer? I am uh, a former lawyer, a recovering lawyer. You have a legal degree, correct? Yes, I do. Okay. So, Secretary Mnuchin, you're trying to tell Chairman Powell to send over remaining funds right now, and you're claiming falsely, in my opinion, but that is what the law says. You've gotten into a disagreement with someone who's actually a lawyer. Are, are you a lawyer? you're not listening to Congress, which actually wrote the law about what it says. Okay, I, actually, I wrote the law with the Congress law for what it's worth. And by the way, it's not $450 billion he's returning. I think it's approximately $175 billion. Reclaiming my time, there was no question there. Secretary Mnuchin, 
The CARES Act already says in exhibit for in, um, in section 4027, it says that you have to stop making any new investments, new investments in Fed lending programs year end. It doesn't say that the Fed programs must stop making loans or purchases. You are making a decision that does not align with the statute or congressional intent. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, thank you for being here. Uh, would you like to further your comments for just a minute uh, on, on the last exchange there as to your, your rationale? I feel like you got cut off there for uh, a bit. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I, I think what I will do is follow up with the chair and the ranking member so we clarify both 4027 and 4029. Uh, again, I've had these discussions with the Senate. Uh, and again, if there's any misunderstanding on this, uh, again, this can be changed. Appreciate it. Thank you, very, thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Chairman Powell, um, if I can ask you a question. The Fed balance sheet currently stands at $7.2 trillion, uh, more than $3 trillion above where we started at the beginning of the year. At the hearing on June 17th, I asked uh, you about how the Fed would manage its balance sheet uh, going forward to mitigate inflationary pressures. I think we need to keep this issue uh, in mind in light of the unusual monetary and fiscal tactics uh, we've been required to employ this year to maintain the economic uh, growth and stability that we've had. Uh, when we spoke, uh, you commented that during the last recovery, going back a ways, the Fed waited until it was, quote, well down the path of recovery, end quote, uh, before deciding what to do. Uh, in that you asserted that the balance sheet, I don't think, I think in your words, doesn't present uh, issues at the current time, suggesting uh, that addressing the balance sheet size uh, was not a priority. We're now six months later. Uh, our economy has, begin, has begun to recover. The unemployment rate has fallen from approximately 10% to closer to 7%. Mul multiple vaccine trials have been successful, uh, and we're expecting distribution in the not distant future. Uh, are you, we're not out of the woods yet, but there is cause, I think, for optimism about our economic recovery. Could you comment on the indicators that you're watching closely uh, as you consider taking steps to begin to restore uh, the Fed's balance sheet to its pre-pandemic levels? Sure. So our, our priority remains supporting the economy until we're really well through this. We, we are going to keep our... Um, rates low and, and keep our tools working until we feel like we really are, are very clearly <clears throat> at, past the danger that's presented to the economy from the pandemic. So we're not considering pulling back any of our support for the economy, and we're not going to until we feel very confident that it's no longer necessary. The time will come to, to start thinking about balance sheet issues, and we have the model of what we did in the last financial uh, recovery, and I was, I was at the Fed during those years when we were considering that. That time will come. It's well into the future. I think we know, we know how to do it, and that's slowly and carefully. I think we've also seen all of these years of large balance sheets, and um, understandably, people were, were concerned after quantitative easing began that there would be inflationary pressures or market distortionary uh, problems, but we really didn't see them, so we, we don't we don't want the balance sheet to be, in the long run, any bigger than it needs to be. But uh, the main thing for us is to keep the support that the economy needs until we're confident that it no longer needs it. Thank you for your comments. If I can shift gears, uh, Chairman Powell, uh, as you know, LIBOR is linked to almost $400 trillion in financial contracts. Uh, so the implications of the transition away from the benchmark are quite significant. Um, I'm especially concerned about some of the, uh, the tough legacy contracts reference LIBOR uh, and are unchangeable. On Monday, the Fed, FDIC, and the OCC uh, issued statement recognizing uh, some of these developments and reiterating, among other things, that banks should transition away from U.S. dollar LIBOR as soon as practical. Uh, are you concerned that some financial market participants may continue to reference LIBOR and contracts uh, even after the relevant phase-out dates? Well, as you know, um, we've provided guidance to market participants that we, would, we uh, would strongly discourage the use of LIBOR for new contracts after the end of 2021. 
and and then uh, there's a proposal which which will go out for comment. But the idea would be that LIBOR would cease to be published, would cease to exist, except in the, in the tail <clears throat> in the remaining outstanding contracts at, at June 30, 2023. So it's very important that people understand those that LIBOR should not be assumed to be continue to be published after that. That does mean there will be a, a so-called hard tail, and we do think that that will take legislation, and we've been, we've been working with Congress and also at the New York State level on that. So we think that's important, but not, not urgent from a time standpoint, but something that we'll need to get done. Thank you very much. Thank you both for being here. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman, I have consistently called for greater fiscal aid. He testified, quote, the risk of overdoing it is less than the risk of underdoing it, end quote. I agree with you here, Chairman Powell. This is not a question of either or. We absolutely need further stimulus, but Congress has also provided the Fed with over $450 billion to support lending to cities, states, and small businesses. Now, in fact, in your March 23rd press release announcing these emergency lending facilities, you state three times that the Fed is, quote, committed to using its full range of tools and authorities, end quote. Yet in less than 24 hours, you gave up any resistance to Secretary of Munition's arbitrary demand to shutter these facilities by the end of the year, including the municipal liquidity and Main Street lending facilities. So I, I wanted to build on uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Axney's line, and just to further sort of enumerate and unpack the sobering landscape, landscape likely before us. So yes or no, please. With the ongoing pandemic, do you expect the number of cities and states facing historic budget shortfalls to continue to rise? Chairman I, I don't really have a strong expectation on that, but that, that may be right. I'll take that as a yes. Do you expect further state and municipal credit downgrades, making it more difficult for state and local governments to borrow? There have been 337 downgrades uh, so far. Do you expect that to happen to more, yes or no? I think it's probable. Okay. Um, I'll take that as a yes. Are we facing an unprecedented wave of small business closures, yes or no? I think that's uncertain. We, <laughs> unprecedented wave, I don't know that we know that. Is the, okay. Is the rescue of small businesses essential to any long-term economic recovery, yes or no? Yes, it's important. And would failure to provide relief to cities, states, and small businesses further widening existing inequalities, including, but not limited to the racial and gender wealth gaps, yes or no? I, look, I. I think it is, yes, uh, I think is, I, I'm sorry, yes or no questions for these questions. I'm just going to answer you, which is that I think that it is important that, that, that these Reclaiming groups time. get additional Reclaiming fiscal my, support. My Thank my you. And I, please don't, I don't want you to filibuster here, okay, because these issues are of, of great import and part of your job is forecasting. So I'm, I'm leaning in on your expertise. So um, again, yes or no, this exacerbate racial and gender wealth gaps. Failure to provide relief to cities and states. I think there's a risk businesses. of that. I think there's a risk of that, yes. So, Chairman, uh, the Federal Reserve lends at a ratio of 10 to 1. So if Congress set aside $400 billion to cover any potential losses, you can lend up to how much uh, to these facilities? What's that amount? Ten, whatever, 10 times the amount of equity that's been pledged. So it would have been several, multiple trillion, four trillion or so. Of course, that borrowing happened. Okay. It, that borrowing happened. Okay. It just didn't so, happen in the facility. So, so over $4 trillion. So you have a responsibility to support maximum employment, yet in the midst of a global pandemic, you have been complicit in eliminating over $4 trillion in potential relief to cities, states, and small businesses. And then adding insult to injury, the secretary wants to move this money to Treasury's general fund, conveniently out of the incoming administration and in direct violation of the CARES Act. I know there's been this sort of, uh, you know, Jedi mind trick going on here, but, you know, we know what our intentions are. We can read. And it's supposed to be available for up to five years. So I'm not even sure why we've been going back and forth on that. Um, but I, I did also just want to ask about, um, 
Uh, let me for a moment just turn uh, to Secretary Mnuchin, just uh, building on the line uh, from my colleague, uh, Congresswoman uh, Porter here. So what is at stake in uh, Section... What does it state in Section 4027, subsection C, paragraph 2 of the CARES Act? Just want to make sure we're 4027 allows, to the extent we've made an example in an, an, an existing loan to an airline, if we need to advance additional money to that airline in a protective capacity, or if we have expenses, that's what 4027 applies to. And uh, again, it, it, it says uh, very clearly that there are certain funds that can be used to 2026 and will continue to be available in 4027. 4027 and 4029 work together. 4029 has the well, December 31st, 2020. I'm, I'm reclaiming my time because, I don't know, we must be reading a different text. So, you know, Mr. Secretary, Section 4027. The gentle lady's time has expired. Two. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Secretary Mnuchin, uh, thank you for your prior support for credit risk transfer as a means of reforming Freddie and Fannie as expressed in Treasury, the administration's housing reform plan. Uh, does that support still exist, and do Treasury and the administration still support CRT for the GSEs, and more importantly, the de-risking of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that protects taxpayers? Yes. Would you like to elaborate any on uh, on uh, I activity? think credit risk transfer is a very effective mechanism of uh, supporting the institutions. I also think that capital accumulation is something that is very important and ultimately capital raising so that taxpayers are not at risk. Thank you. Uh, as you know, myself and many of my colleagues uh, in both chambers of Congress, a variety of stakeholders who have filed comments have urged FHFA to ensure a robust risk-based CRT market in the new capital framework for the GSEs. And while I support the capitalization of the enterprises, I have real concerns about the impact of FHFA's capital role on the CRT market. FSOC and Treasury provided a brief four-page review of FHFA's 400-plus page proposed capital rule with little to no analysis of the impact on the markets for CRT or mortgage-backed securities. Do you think FH, FHFA's capital rule provides adequate capital relief for CRT and has Treasury, FSOC, or the Office of Financial Research examined the effects this rule could have on the CRT market or access to mortgage credit? We, we have done some work on that, and we'd be happy to follow up with you on it. Thank you. I would appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Powell, uh, you were filibustered earlier. Did you have any further comments? The floor is yours. I'll give it to you. I've got three minutes. Cool. Thank you. I, I just would say that, um, uh, for example, the Muni facility, um, the level of municipal borrowing is set to exceed the all-time annual record this year. And that's, that's because of the backstop of this facility. You don't measure the success of the facility by the amount of lending it does. It succeeded in restoring, um, you know, borrowing in the markets at very low levels for municipalities and, and other, inst other, you know, state and local government entities across the credit spectrum small, medium, and large. So I just say, I think it's been quite a success. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ma Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you both so much for uh, coming to offer your testimony today um, and, and your expertise. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, not to belabor the point, but I did want to uh, dive back in here to um, section 4027 and 4029 that you're referencing. I, I do think it's important that we discuss this because you are um, you you are bringing it up as as the main rationale as to why you are uh, kind of bringing these funds back into uh, the the general the exchange stabilization fund. Um, so you know first and, and quickly section 4027 has of CARES explicitly states that unused funds are to be returned to the Exchange Stabilization Fund uh, until, or rather, on January 1st, 2026, correct? That is correct, and that will occur on January okay. 1st, 2026. 
So, um, and that's with respect to, to the unused funds. Now, section 4029. No, it's not uh, the unused, fun, it's the unused funds in the ESF at that time. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, now, section 4029 refers to rescinding authority uh, to making new loans, right? So, the law explicitly does contemplate, you know, it has that, that section A, B, and C. Um, and it, it does explicitly contemplate that remaining funding as of January 1st, 2021, which is you know, just in a matter of weeks, to be available for restructuring, modification, amendment, and administrative costs. Is, is that right? That is correct. Um, and so I was, I was wondering if, if I could give you the opportunity to discuss about instead of choosing to return those funds, I, and you are choosing to return those funds, right? No, I'm not. I'm not choosing to return those funds. Whether the funds are returned or the funds aren't returned, 4029 governs both direct and indirect. So again, I, I could have allocated all 500 billion on day one to the Federal Reserve. I allocated 200 billion. It, it really is irrelevant. It's the 4029 governs the same provision whether money's sitting in, 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 in any of the accounts. That was the purpose of 4029. If you don't read that way for 4029, then it, it shouldn't have existed. There is no purpose to have the December 31st, 2020 date. And again, I personally negotiated these documents. I, I understand. And I'm, I'm trying to seek clarification because we are in such a desperate position given the unfortunate gridlock. I think it, it's, that we're all kind of in, we're all aligned in interest in trying to figure out where we can explore maximum flexibility as offered by the statute. And so I'm, I'm just curious if instead of choosing to kind of return, or rather, I, instead of returning these funds, instead of reading um, the, the interpretation as returning these funds to the ESF, could you use, could we use this modification statute to recapitalize loans? Recapitalize existing loans? Yes. So again, in my example, we have made airline loans. So people are focusing yes. on the 13.3. These facilities, this, this governs both the direct loans and the indirect loans. In the case of if there's an airline loan that we have already made and we need to make protective advances after December 31st, 2020, the statute allows us to do that. And, and again, it doesn't matter whether I had allocated 500 billion, I just want to put this in perspective, mm -hmm. of the 190 billion I allocated that would have done $2 trillion of lending, I believe we've done like 25 billion uh, in, in total. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about this, this is irrelevant in the broader scheme of things. So, and to kind of return, airline example, are there other examples of advances that could be provided ahead of the sunset date? Again, on any of the existing underlying loans. So if there is a Main Street loan that has already been made, and that Main Street loan needs a protective advance after December 31st, 2020, that can be done. The difference between 4027 and 4029 okay, has to do with existing loans versus new loans. So again, it's very clear, 4029 refers to make new loans, loan guarantees, or other investments shall terminate. Thank you very much. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I want to first align myself with the comments from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Um, we need to help small businesses across this country. It is, it is critical. It is past time. Um, businesses in my district and the, the state of South Carolina are struggling. Um, we have tourism-related uh, businesses that are set back. We have businesses. We have uh, bars and restaurants, gyms, yoga studios. They're struggling. And um, that's in South Carolina, where we're mostly reopened. Here in D.C., uh, they just went to 25 percent capacity for restaurants. The hotel I'm staying in has permanently closed their uh, restaurant and their rooftop bar until the restrictions are lifted. Um, 
we need to help the businesses that are being put out of work by the government. Government closures uh, are, are helpful in certain cities, but in others, um, we need to safely reopen. And any business that is being closed because of the government um, must get relief. It is a taking and it is wrong. So first, we need to get additional PPP loans. Um, we need to help the businesses that are struggling the most, but we've got to be surgical about it. We don't need to paint with a broad brush. Um, to that end, uh, my first question is to both of you. Um, there's no denying that the federal government has spent an exorbitant amount of money this year to combat both the health and economic toil of the virus. As our national debt climbs towards 30 trillion, it could very well hit 30 trillion next year between the next COVID relief package and deficit spending for next year. Um, we as policymakers are looking to provide targeted relief for our constituents. How do we get the best bang for our buck? In other words, what type of economic relief or stimulus would be the most effective in preserving and creating jobs? And secondly, how would you recommend policymakers address our mounting debt over the next few years? Well, I would say for small businesses, the simplest and most effective thing that can be done is authorize me to use the $140 billion sitting in the accounts of the general fund for additional PPP loans. We spent a lot of time on 4027 and 4029. I unfortunately don't have the legal authority to spend this money, and I would like the legal authority. That would be the simplest thing to do. My next question is, is that enough? Is, is, that, is that enough? What about the, the businesses that have had a 97% revenue loss, uh, you know, whether it's an event venue or a minor league baseball team or any other business that has been totally shut down? Um, you know, they... they are not looking at this uh, as a, we need more PPP loans. They're looking at it from the perspective of the government has literally ended all revenue, ended all revenue. W what do we do for those businesses? Well, the good news about PPP loans is if you use the money correctly, they go and immediately become grants and they're forgiven. And I do agree we should pass legislation to simplify the, the grant forms. Uh, and, and I agree with you, stages, restaurants, entertainment business, and $140 billion isn't enough. I would allocate $300 billion to this immediately. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I, I appreciate that sentiment. And I urge um, everyone involved uh, that we pass this immediately. It needs to be done before Christmas. Um, and I don't think it's productive talking about whether the president's playing golf or not. Uh, everyone is at fault. Politics are what is to blame, and we need to rise above the politics, and we need to get this done. Um, I'm going to ask some uh, additional questions. Um, Secretary Mnuchin, yesterday before the Senate Banking Committee, you indicated that uh, Fannie and Freddie should not be released from conservatorship without appropriate capital. Can you expound on that a bit? Uh, does that mean that they should have at least the required amount of capital under the eighth? FHFA's new capital rule, and would that be the minimum capital level or the minimum capital level plus the buffer specified in the 2020 rule? Well, let me just be clear. Uh, despite the fact that the director and I are having conversations, we've made no decisions at Treasury whatsoever yet. We are contemplating. But there could be a scenario where at some point between basically the zero capital they have and the full capital requirement, there would be a consent order and they would be released subject to a consent order. But as I've said yesterday, there's got to be significant capital for them, in my opinion, to be released. Thank you. Um, I, I want to really thank both of you for all the work you've done in the last year. It has been truly remarkable. And um, I'm optimistic that we can get on the other side of this pandemic soon and get our economy back humming. And um, with that, I, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Weck, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you very much, Secretary Mnuchin and Chairman for joining us here today and for all your work during this pandemic. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, one of the facilities that you're allowing to expire at the end of the year is the Main Street Lending Program, which, as we've discussed, has had a number of issues and I would submit has been really kind of a disappointment. I mean, it was designed to support up to $600 billion in lending to small businesses and medium-sized businesses, but in eight months, it's only supported about $5 billion of loans. Uh, 
to about 420 companies. Do, do those numbers sound right to you, Secretary, Secretary Mnuchin? They do, and I would acknowledge I'm disappointed uh, as well that there wasn't more take up. It was something the Fed and we worked very hard, but it was very difficult to design a program that could be really used. Well, one of the loans that that was to a Welshire financial services with a company that is in car title lending. And I assume you're familiar with this loan because it was it's been reported in the media lately. Have you have you are you familiar with this loan that was made? I'm I'm really not familiar with the loan. I've seen some things in the media, but I, I don't have access to the underlying loan documents and the underlying loan files that the Fed has. Right. So you didn't you didn't have a role in in making this loan because it was only between the lender and the borrower, right? I, I had no the role uh, other than setting the policies with the Fed chair for the facilities, and I assume the okay. loan complies, but I don't know. And one of the policies, though, was that was that that those loans would not be available to finance or lending institutions, correct? I believe that's correct, but I'm not I'm not familiar with the details of the loan, as I said, you're referring to. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about it because they were able to exploit a loophole in the law by organizing into this as a consumer uh, credit access company rather than a lender. Uh, and they did that in Texas to avoid uh, their usury laws there. And so now they have a twenty five million dollar loan from the U.S. government, taxpayer funded at 3%, which they're lending out to people at 350%. Would you, would you agree, assuming that that is correct, would you agree that this violates the spirit and the intent of the law and the regulations? I, I would, and I would expect that the loan will be reviewed and audited. It. Okay, so, so you agree that it's not a good look, especially given that, that it has come to light that the the uh, owner of the company is a major donor to the president. Again, as I've said, I don't know the specifics alone, but I agree based upon what you're saying, that was not the spirit and the intent of the use of, of the loans. Can I get a commitment from you here today that we'll review that loan and consider clawing back the money? Well, you have to get that from the Fed because they administer the program. I, I don't administer it. I don't have that ability, but I'm sure Chair Powell can respond to Chairman that. Powell. Right Chairman Powell, can I get a commitment from you to to consider clawing back the money and review this loan? So let me well, just, I, I, it's really inappropriate for me to try to comment on individual loans like the Secretary. I'm not involved in the process. I will say this. People make representations. We, we set out clear rules. They have to be obeyed. And we'll, we'll always look. Uh, and and if, if, if they're not obeyed or if, if um, you know, uh, incorrect representations are made, then, then the consequences will follow. And we will look at all of the loans in that light. Very good. Thank you. Now, Secretary Mnuchin, a lot of discussion has been taking place in, in this hearing today about whether you have to um, expire, whether these programs have to expire at the end of the calendar or whether you're allowing them to expire. And I understand that you're saying your reading and your interpretation is that you must that they that they expire and you don't have any discretion in that. I can't help but suspect that had the results of the election for president been different, your interpretation would be different. But I would inquire: Have you had an opportunity to speak to incoming Treasury Secretary Yellen? I have. Okay, very good. And have you discussed with her your intention to 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 end these facilities? I have discussed with her. We are cooperating with the transition. I had a very good working relationship with her when she was the Fed chair. And uh, I have advised her that my reading of this and my interpretation was non-political and uh, was following the law. So yes, I did advise her of that. And did she, was she disappointed or did she disagree with your interpretation of the law? She, she didn't reflect uh, a interpretation one way or another. Thank you very much. I will yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Taylor, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Appreciate uh, this hearing and appreciate your gentleman's hard work during an unprecedented 2020, uh, one that we really didn't see coming. Um, I want to talk about the policy decisions that are made in this building versus broad help, which is what we did in the spring, versus targeted help, which I think is something that we're talking more about. Uh, 
Heretofore, I have heard some reluctance to go to targeted specific help, and I'll, I'll use airlines as an example. So that's something we made a decision in the spring. We're going to give targeted specific help in the there's airline space because that, there's a need there. In 2020, uh, one that we really didn't see coming. Madam, um, Madam Chair, can we get that? Talk about the policy decisions that are made in this building versus broad help, which is what we did in the spring, versus targeted help which I think is something that we're talking if you more about. Suspend for a moment uh, till we get the audio straightened out. It's calling to me. Can resume. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so as, as we think about you know, it's something I've been very concerned about is the hospitality space, uh, largely because the, the unemployment there numbers are so enormous. Uh, talking in the, the 10 million people that are currently unemployed as a result of COVID, approximately half are in, are in just in one specific sector uh, in the hospitality space. So it is my concern or belief that we need to be targeted in this building. Uh, and I'll point out that the problem solver package that came out yesterday, um, the PPP reload was designed specifically, it's a much smaller number by saying you had to have a 35% drop in revenue. Right, so that, that created a, a limiter of kinds to say, all right, hey, if you're doing well, you're not going to be able to get a PPP reload. Uh, and I have businesses in my district that do telemedicine, and their sales are up 100, 200, 300 percent because telemedicine is a big thing, right? They're doing better. They don't need a PPP loan. Uh, they, they still have business problems, but it's not a PPP reload that they need. Um, uh, Chairman Powell, would you, would you concur that it is time to begin to think more about specific targeted help rather than broad help um, into sectors that are in, in harm's way? You know, I, I think the, uh, the timing and the scope and the co components of this are really up to you. I, I would say I do see a number of uh, areas, and I mentioned them earlier, including small businesses that, that do need help, and I think that would be broadly very helpful for the economy were that to happen. And I, I, I'll point out it's probably better for the taxpayer uh, rather than just handing out tons of money everywhere to be specific. Secretary Mnuchin, would you like to speak to the need of targeted assistance versus broad assistance? Yes, I, I agree completely. And uh, as you've rightly said, if we're going to do more PPP loans, we should have a provision that companies' revenues are down. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, okay. Well, I, I certainly uh, – appreciate your guidance and insight, and we'll continue to advocate on that front. Uh, and I have to admit I've been somewhat entertained by the discussion about, for, about uh, Section 429, which I've had to pull up and read just to make sure I was thinking about it correctly. Um, and I'll just, I'll just read 429B. On December 31st, 2020, the authority to provide under this subtitle to make new, lo new loans, loan guarantees, or other investments shall terminate. That seems very clear. Um, in terms of, that's 429B. So the ability for you to make new loans, uh, Mr. Secretary, new loans, loan guarantees or other investments terminates. Is that, I mean, that's what the law says. I think that's what you're saying. It, it is, and as I've said, if the committee, anybody on this committee doesn't think that's what it said and they think that that doesn't apply, then they would have given me unlimited authority to use this money forever, sure. and I don't know why 4029 would have been inserted. So I haven't had anybody well, rightfully explain if 4029 doesn't, it, what was the purpose of it? Sure, and I mean, in 429B, again, I mean, it could, it could have said December 31st, 2021, in which case it would go on for another year, but it, it's clearly the end of this year is the termination of your authority under the law. And I, I just want to say, um, I'm a believer that equal law, equal protection under the law, and then I, I commend you for following the law and reading the law and not trying to twist it into something that it was never meant to be. Uh, the law seems very clear to me, Mr. Secretary, and I certainly applaud your efforts to comply with it, um, despite a lot of bizarre efforts to try to twist it into something that it's not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I wish we spent as much time talking about PPP loans as we have as 4027 and 4029. Uh, and I would also just say, when we passed this law, we thought it was highly unlikely that we'd need to be using these at this period of time. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Chairman Powell, Secretary Mnuchin for attending the, this hearing and for helping the committee with its work. Uh, <clears throat> so let's talk about January 1st because we have uh, much uh, pandemic-related support that's going away uh, right now unless, unless action is taken. Uh, we also had last week, I think, 827,000 new unemployment claims. Uh, again, going back to the rental assistance that's pandemic related, uh, that's scheduled to expire December 31st as well. Uh, Secret Mr. Sec I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're going to be in a bad place, I think, uh, on January 1st. And even if there were a last ditch effort, to by Congress to put something in place. What we saw in the CARES Act was there was a considerable lag time before we could actually get the help out to the American people, uh, whether that was small businesses or, or people waiting for uh, stimulus checks or uh, supplemental unemployment benefits working with the states. Uh, is there power that you have uh, independent of of, of Congress in terms of an appropriations. I'm talking about, uh, let's, let's take renter's uh, assistance for right now. Uh, the forbearance that we might allow renters who don't have the ability to pay their rent. Of course, we'd have to protect the small landlords, the landlords that are out there uh, who are getting pressure from uh, banks and, and mortgage companies to pay their, uh, you know, to, to render payment to them, and then ultimately to the, the bondholders as well, uh, you know, that under, underwrote those, those mortgages and are expecting payments. Do you have independent power that, that might pro provide relief uh, in the short term uh, until Congress can get its act together and, and, and come to agreement on a, on a larger uh, package similar to what we did in the CARES Act? Sir, we, um, we do have broad powers, but we don't have that kind of powers. That, those are really powers that fall to the legislature. Nobody elected us. You, you, you created us under statute. You gave us very specific powers, and they don't involve. I understand that, but I was here in 2008, and uh, the folks on your side of the table, you know, were, were doing their darndest to, to rescue Wall Street. And uh, now, now it's Main Street that's, that's under the gun. And so... Uh, you know, I'm just I'm just asking for the same same consideration and the same sense of urgency when it's regular workers uh, uh, or or just average families that are struggling to pay their rent. I, I would just like to see that that level of urgency and seriousness that I saw back in 2008 when when we were trying to rescue the big banks. Um, I, I I have to be honest. I I I. I think I see a little bit of laissez-faire uh, with respect to average families. Uh, I don't see that, that sense of urgency, uh, you know, and, and Mr. Secretary, with all due respect, you seem way too eager to, to give away or give back or render back the, the resources that were available. Uh, I didn't see a long and, and hard discussion about how can we get this money out to the people who need it. Rather, it was, well, this is what the law says, I'm going to do it, you know. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't see any extraordinary effort on the part of Treasury to find a way, to find a way, you know, go into, go into court, ask for an interpretation to say, do I have the ability to continue this, these, these payments and this, this relief to the American people, or am I prohibited from doing so, rather than huddling with with lawyers who work for you, and I've got work lawyers that work for me as well. I didn't see an extraordinary effort on your part to try to make sure we could find a way to make sure that uh, the, the incoming administration has some resources to, to deal with this problem. I just want to be clear. I spent the last four months trying to work with Congress to get additional legislation passed. I've been on probably we all have calls. We all That's have. What people need. We all have. People need fiscal response. These programs were not used. So let me just be clear.
People need, and again, people need more PPP money. They need grants. They need airline support. They need unemployment insurance. These facilities were not being used. And I've worked every day to try to get Congress to pass more legislation. So I, 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 I don't appreciate that comment that I haven't worked hard. Well, sir, I would just say that uh, what I saw when Wall Street was, was on the hook was creativity to the nth degree in ways of repurposing money to, to make sure they, they, they got what they needed. And I, I would just... The gentleman's time has expired. I, I would just say, I yield back. if I had any... From New York, Mr. Zeldin is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, feel free to use uh, some of my time here to complete your thought. I'll yield to you. Thank you. I was just saying, if I had any legal authority or I could get the president to sign an EO tomorrow to send out the $140 billion to small businesses that need PPP loans, I would do that. And again, for all the conversations we've had on these facilities, which were barely being used, most of which did support big corporations, I might add, okay, and not Main Street, enough money to Main Street. Main Street needs more money, grants, PPP. Thank you. Well, thank you, Al, for being here today. Thank you to, Chair, to Chairwoman Waters, Member McHenry, for being uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Chairman Al. I, I want to start off by saying thank you to both of you for your leadership during this pandemic, especially as it pertains to standing up and fine-tuning these needed liquidity facilities. Uh, first off, uh, I would share that uh, with regards to the Paycheck Protection Program. I've heard from business owners in my district, from local mayors and others, about how the Paycheck Protection Program has not only saved small businesses and small business jobs, uh, but saved in the entirety of, of Main Streets in the first congressional district of New York. Um, with regards to the facilities, uh, the, the original municipal liquidity facility term sheet excluded my home county of Suffolk, where my constituents live, but the Federal Reserve and tre Treasury listened to the concerns that I and others raised about lowering the population thresholds for eligible issuers. Uh, this provided greater access to a much needed backstop financing tool for many state and local governments and entities like the MTA. I want to say thank you for your attention to this critical market and the commitment to remaining vigilant of any problems as they arise because we need all levels of government to work together. Now, this is not a time to be Republicans first or Democrats first. This is a time to be Americans first. Secretary Mnuchin, late one night, I got on the phone with a local Democrat county executive to talk to us about the municipal equity facility and getting eligibility for Suffolk County. And you listen to our concerns. Uh, the municipal liquidity facility is set to expire at the end of this month. Uh, and that all unused CARES Act funds at the liquidity facilities, uh, my understanding, will be returned to, to the Treasury Department. But I want to make sure Congress, Treasury, and the Federal Reserve are working together and remaining vigilant into 2021 as well. To ensure adequate municipal debt liquidity, the municipal liquidity facility should remain in operation into 2021 until we know for sure we are out of the woods. The onus is not just on the Federal Reserve and Treasury. Congress needs to step up to the plate and get a COVID-19 relief bill across the finish line. Secretary Mnuchin, I know how hard you have been working over the course of what has been many months, uh, which is why I'm, I'm glad that you had an opportunity here to help clear the, the record uh, as to the allegations that were and the charges that were just being made in your direction. You've been working extremely hard, and I want to thank you for your efforts in negotiating the next bill. A Congress provided support for state and some local governments in the CARES Act, but limited the support for local governments with more than 500,000 in population. Uh, Chairman Powell, in the Senate Banking Committee hearing in May, you talked about the negative effects on the overall economy that come about when state and local governments face serious fiscal constraints, citing evidence from the 2008 financial crisis. It is clear the fiscal solvency of all levels of government is important for economic recovery. Can you elaborate on the importance of the health of all levels of government for the health and growth of the overall U.S. economy? So, 
Uh, state and local governments provide, uh, as you suggest, provide critical services, fire, police, uh, sanitation, all those things that people depend on uh, public safety and live under balanced budget requirements in essentially all the states. And so what, what happens uh, when costs go up and revenues go down is that they lay people off. And um, they've laid off of more than a million people so far. Um, and uh, that was a big problem uh, in, in the years after the, after the global financial crisis. We hope it doesn't become a big, a big problem here. But these are, these are critical government services, and uh, as I've said, it's up, to, it's up to Congress and the administration, but I think that's an, an important area to look at for further support. Uh, I thank you both for all of your efforts uh, since we were first hit by this pandemic. Again, thank you, Chairwoman, rank member for holding I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Hawaii, Mrs. Gebhard, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you both for making the time to come and uh, have this discussion today. Um, Mr. Mnuchin, you, you made a comment about how uh, you wish there were more questions about the PPP program. Uh, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about that today, given a comment you just made and also the news that's come out about how uh, lar the, some of the largest businesses that qualified under PPP took up the majority of the money. So as, as we look to a new stimulus package, whether it's this year or it comes out early next year, what improvements would you recommend that uh, the PPP program take on to ensure that the majority of those dollars are actually going to the small businesses within our communities who are barely keeping their, their heads above water uh, trying to survive. Well, thank you. When we created the original program, the entire economy was shut down. But now that that's not the case, I, I agree with you, it should be much more targeted. I think it should be focused on the smaller businesses. I think it should be focused on a revenue decline. Chair Waters and I worked on a set-aside to make sure there was money available for uh, underserved areas. I think that's something that should be done again. We've signed up many more CDFIs since then that are, are ready to go. I also very much support uh, a program of investing 10 to $12 billion in CDFIs so that they can do $100 billion of lending. I think there's big bipartisan support. I've spoken to Chair Waters, uh, Senator Warner and Crapo and, and others. So I, I think there's a lot of things that could be done very, very quickly that would have a big impact. There's no question uh, that the need is there and the frustration, especially as these reports come out about where the money has gone and uh, a lot of folks have been left stranded. I wanna pivot for a second in a different direction that hasn't been covered today um, in the area of sanctions. You know, I, I have served on the Foreign Affairs Committee for my first six years in Congress and. Uh, both in Congress as well as in the executive branch, sanctions is often one of the first go-to actions um, to take within the realm of, of foreign policy for a variety of reasons. Uh, I, I pulled recently the list of U.S. sanctions that we have on countries and industries and individuals around the world, and it is a very exhaustive list, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, with some sanctions even going back uh, decades. Um, can you speak to the Department of Treasury's process and whether or not you work with other federal agencies and departments like the Department of State, Department of Defense and others to assess the effectiveness of these economic sanctions uh, once they have been levied? Uh, and if you do that, how often really with the intent of saying, OK, these sanctions have been put in place, are they achieving the intended objective? Uh, and if not, what what are they doing and, and what unintended negative consequences uh, are there? Well, first, let me just say I really appreciate you bringing up this subject, and uh, I'd be more than happy to follow up with you offline. I, I spent an enormous amount of my time. Uh, really, before the pandemic, I was spending 50 percent of my time on the sanctions. I think they're very, very effective foreign policy tools. Uh, we coordinate 100 percent with both the State Department, the National Security Council, the intelligence agencies on anything we do. So we have a robust interagency process. Uh, 
I, I uh, am going to encourage uh, Chair Yellen to spend time on this. Uh, I also want to thank the committee and Congress. You've given us a lot of funding over the last four years. We've increased the number of people we have in these areas, and these are very effective tools combined with our strong military. But in many cases, uh, they are very, very powerful tools and, and don't put our military in harm's way. So before my time runs out, uh, if, if you can speak briefly, and if not, I, I'd like to follow up with you. I'd love to know what specific mechanisms and measures of effectiveness you and these other departments use in order to make sure that they are achieving an intended objective, as well as what measures of impact do you use to say, hey, this these sanctions against this country were intended for this purpose, but it's actually stopping this country from getting medicine and food and basic supplies, creating a, a, a negative humanitarian effect. That's a very thoughtful question, I might just add. So, uh, in the best case scenario, uh, we see a specific action as a result of the sanction and we remove the sanctions, but we also work very hard on humanitarian issues and issuing licenses for that. Gentle ladies, is up. The yeah. gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. I'm sorry, where is he? Mr. Davidson, is you're on mute. I think he's trying to get off of mute. I think you're on. Hello? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the recognition. Ignition, uh, Chow and Secretary Nugent, thank you for the time you've given us today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the way you've handled our questions and the way you've pointed out what the law that Congress passed uh, actually says, uh, and, and frankly, for faithfully following that law. Um, we do need fiscal policy, uh, not just monetary policy, and frankly, we need Congress. Uh, by the way it sounds, some of my colleagues would just strike Article One from the Constitution and have uh, the executive branch do everything. So I I'm glad that, uh, that, that the body is, stays relevant, and I'm hopeful that we can do some of the good things that did happen. So let me highlight a couple things that constituents uh, in the 8th District of Ohio share with me. One, uh, you know, Chairman Powell, the Federal Reserve had a very robust and very swift and decisive response uh, in the last um, half of March and the early days of April so those first two, three weeks, uh, there was a true liquidity crisis that was uh, hitting our markets and truly global because the demand for dollars uh, wasn't just here in our markets. The demand was global. So you saw OPEC countries dump oil into the market, sucking cash, U.S. dollars uh, into their countries uh, as a way for them to, to get liquidity. But you saw holders of all sorts of assets, including municipal bonds, uh, generally considered very safe and liquid. Um, you know, disappear. There was no buy side. So uh, the Federal Reserve's uh, response in providing liquidity there, to me, fits right in line with the whole purpose of the broad authority under 13.3. Um, but nevertheless, we saw under 13.3 some distortions uh, that have carried over as we've seen the size of the Fed's balance sheet grow. And some of the questions on that, I think, are, are relevant. How big does it grow? Uh, well, big enough to make sure we provide economic stability. That was the clear intent of the CARES Act, uh, but not so big that it causes true economic distortions. And where the inflation is showing up isn't in consumer prices. A lot of people fear and frankly know that it's in marketable securities on Wall Street. And while that benefits retirement savings, uh, it, it, it accentuates the wealth gap. Um, you know, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, thanks for calling attention to the payroll protection plan. Um, that was tremendous for Ohio's 8th District. 
Uh, and in our district, we had about 9,000 loans made. 80% uh, of them were for $150,000 or less. So they were small loans and overwhelmingly made by smaller lenders. Uh, and what was the effect of that? Well, we had over 100,000 people in Ohio's 8th District stay on payroll. So the loan did go to the business, of course, but for the purpose of keeping payroll happen. And the benefit of that was so many of these individuals, their families kept benefits, health insurance and other things that come with employment. So it's been a tremendous source of stability. So I congratulate my colleagues on the success of the payroll action plan, but frankly on tre Treasury and the, the SBA and others, all the banks that made this functional. The concern we have is the slow walking of forgiveness on the back end. So I, I hope you can give some attention to that. And as, uh, as time dwindles uh, swiftly, I wanna get to one topic that, that is emerging. So we've seen um, you know, the rise of digital assets and frankly, to the extent that some people have proposed a central bank digital currency uh, as a response uh, to our, our, our monetary situation right now. And <clears throat> I think it's important that we do that very thoughtfully. Would love I think there are some technical difficulties here. Oh, we're past our hard stop, and I apologize for that. We're five minutes past. And so I'd like to thank our distinguished witnesses for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous material to the chair for inclusion in the record. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.